everyone and welcome back to Amazon Q4 Mastery week 2 and this is our day 3. We have Emma with us today and Emma has helped over 700 businesses create a page that will not only make the customers add their products to their cart but they are so aesthetically pleasing that you are going to get a lot of conversion. So hi Emma. Hi Bria, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to speak with you today. Me too. Um, as a creative person myself, I think helping sellers make their products more creative and incorporate the creativity in their branding is so important. So Emma works as a co-founder. She is a co-founder of Marketing by Emma and she has a lot of great ideas on how you can uh, brand your products in such a way that your conversion rates are going to be skyrocketing. So Emma, over to you. Uh, can you tell me why new sellers should be or any seller should be uh, branding their products creatively? Yeah, so th it's so important for a variety of different reasons. One is Amazon has changed a lot in the last few years. And so there are a lot more people that you're competing against. And it's very possible that you're selling a product that is nearly identical to a lot of your competitors. And so then one of the real true ways that you can be setting yourself apart is actually through your branding efforts. That may be one of the only things that customers have to use to decide to purchase from you rather than somebody else. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. Branding is also what allows you to really build uh, longer and stronger relationships with your customers so that they're not just purchasing your product because it's the cheapest or has the most reviews, but because they like what you're doing and then perhaps they want to look at the other products that you're selling or they want to tell other people about it or if it's a, a consumable or something that they would be using with frequency that they don't just go back to Amazon and type in pencils, they type in your pencils because they love you so much that they want to buy those pencils from you or maybe they even want to buy from your your website directly. And then the third piece is trust is always such an important part of any relationship and any transaction. And yeah. when, when you are selling online, it can be very difficult to build that trust and particularly in where when we are where we are right now there are many stories about counterfeit goods and about products that aren't meeting safety specifications and so that branding piece when done well can really work to help cultivate that trust with your customers and and really set up a, a positive long-term relationship with them that is so true because most of the categories that sellers usually sell in are so saturated and there's already so much competition that it becomes hard to stand out. But we have Emma here with us who's going to help us make sure that your product stands out. She has prepared a very, very innovative and very creative PPT with us uh, for us and we are going to get started with it. So the most important question is do new sellers start selling or do new sellers start branding their products online because they are already there's so much competition you know how do new sellers market their product or brand their product in a way that they can compete with big sellers like Nike or Amazon if you're selling shoes you know how hard can it be to sell these products when you have like Nike with their amazing campaigns and their amazing branding so Emma is going to answer that question for you and if you are a new seller or you're already selling on Amazon and if you're confused how you can make your brand more well, stand out, let's get started. Great, thank you so much, Ria. Uh, so yes, I'm gonna be talking all about branding and I'm going to really be focusing a lot on the copy side, but branding is something that really filters into all the choices that you're making as a business. So don't think that branding is just the imagery you use or the words that you use. It's really about creating a cohesive, exciting experience for your customers and why branding is so important particularly now on Amazon is that it can be one of the really exciting ways that smaller sellers can compete against some of the biggest names in the space because a lot of those big names are not necessarily 
doing all of the things right when it comes to selling on Amazon. And so if you can figure that out, you can actually outcompete those names that if you were sitting side by side on a shelf, you would lose the sale to them every time. So as Rhea mentioned, my name's Emma Shermer Tamir. I co-founded Marketing by Emma in 2016 with my husband, Ares, who is standing to the left of me in that photo. And since then, we have been working with companies from all over the world with their copywriting needs, helping them connect with their dream customers and make as many conversions as possible. So before we get into branding more specifically, it's really important to take a step back and think about some of the fundamental things that you absolutely must do in order to sell effectively online. So sometimes when I talk about branding, people assume that these other things don't matter, but these things when combined together can be a very powerful tool to really create a business with the, the success that you're looking for. So first and foremost, a thoughtful, well-researched keyword strategy is essential. Don't just assume that you're going to use the keywords that you need to use naturally. And don't just plug, plug in your keyword research to your tool, take the top 30 words as far as search volume goes and be done with it. You really want to look at all of the res results from a very analytical place and make sure you're finding those keywords that you can be competitive on and the keywords that are most fitting to your product specifically. Sometimes other brand names, for example, may not you may not even realize that it's a competitor's brand name because especially on Amazon, sometimes those brand names are, are not obvious. So making sure that you're paying attention to things like that so that you're not putting your listing or your account at risk uh, is so, so important. However, you also wanna be thinking about when it comes to writing your listing specifically, that you're selecting keywords that are going to make sense when they're customer facing. So just because a keyword has great opportunity and is low competition, it doesn't necessarily mean that it should go into your title, your bullets or your description if it's a very awkward phrase that there's no real way to be able to put that into your copy and make it make sense. So be very thoughtful about how you're using keywords as you're creating your listing uh, and failing to do that can really impact your ability to index and rank properly. You also wanna set your listing up for maximum skimmability because before customers are really going to dive into your listing and figure out whether your your brand and your product is one that they want to shop from they have some basic criteria that they need to figure out so you need to make it very easy for them to zone in and, and whether those are ingredients or materials or where you manufacture you have to understand your those customers main buying criteria and then set up your listing in a way that's going to make it very easy for them to find that information. So some of that is the actual organization of how you present your ideas. And then some of that is also about making sure that every single word that's on your page is either helping you on an SEO level or is helping to push the sale forward. If it's not doing one of those two things, it shouldn't be there. Uh, it can be very tempting to get creative and you want to be creative, but if it's just something that sounds good, that's not actually helping one of those two things, then cut it out. Uh, being very benefit forward is also very important. Customers are ultimately going online to search for a product like yours because they have a problem that they need to solve. And so you want to make it very clear to them what those problems are that you're solving and how your product is going to help make their lives better. It doesn't mean that those features aren't important, but by combining benefits with features together, you can make a really persuasive and strong argument for why your product is the one for them. Building trust is so important, especially when there are countless articles about counterfeit goods and products that aren't meeting safety standards, that trust piece is something that once it's broken, it's very hard to, to fix. 
Some of that will become naturally from paying attention to all of these things. And some of that is even thinking about how you, the types of marketing language you use and making sure that you're not making exaggerated claims or saying that your product is the best at something when it's really not. But that also is going to be directly tied into using impeccable grammar and spelling. So making sure that you don't have any errors there, that you are showing your customers that you have attention to detail, that you respect your product, that you respect them. And your listing and all of your marketing, it's really serving as your salesperson. And so it's the, if you have grammatical errors and awkward language and spelling mistakes. It's like having somebody that just rolled out of bed and smelling like the bar standing in front of your shop versus somebody that is clean shaved, it just showered, smells great, looks fantastic, and is standing out there. Which one is going to be more welcoming and more engaging and like demonstrating that you're a quality place to do business with. Being very customer centric is so important. And that's something uh, that we'll get into a little bit more later on. And then elevating with imagery. So thinking about how you can create a cohesive experience for, uh, for customers, both in your copy and your imagery and how all of those things work together, rather than having your images doing one thing, your copy doing something else, and there's no real unifying thread between all of that. Uh, so I have noticed that most of the sellers use keyword stuffing. And according to you, uh, should a keyword be repeated several times in, let's say, in the title, in the description, and in the bullet points? And do you think it's beneficial for the sellers out there to use keyword, keyword stuffing? Yeah, no, I would say avoid keyword stuffing. Keyword stuffing, so you have to understand, Amazon is their goal with their search algorithm is to figure out how to match somebody with the, the best product that they're looking for as quickly as possible. They're all about making that sale. And so you can have a bunch of keywords in your listing, but if it's not set up to actually convert the customer, then you're still not going to rank in the way that you need to. And as far as repeating keywords, all of the research that I've seen, all of the test cases that I've seen, it doesn't make any difference to be repeating a keyword over and over again that's not necessary sometimes it will happen because you know if you are if you're writing about your product you may just have to naturally repeat some of those words but if you can find other keywords to use in their place then that's going to give you a broader uh, reach rather than just using that space over and over again uh, you also, because economy of words is so important, you know, it's interesting, The an, an Amazon listing isn't really the most attractive or engaging sales page out there. If you look at any other company's website, you know, whether it's just a standalone website or even something like Target, they're much more, they're set up in a way where they're very short bullets and it's all kind of, it's just, it looks very different. But instead, okay. Amazon has this big title and these bulky bullets and then you have to scroll down to get the rest of the information. And so even though you have the space, you don't necessarily want to max it out. So if, let's say that you can use 500 characters per bullet. Do not do that. A big chunk <laughs> of, of text is going to be so uh, intimidating to a customer that they'll look at that, their eyes won't know where to focus, and they're just not even going to read it. And that may that bullet may hold really important information that they are not able to find, and the, your competitor that's advertising on your product page is perhaps doing a better job than you are, and so they're gonna click into that, they're gonna say, oh, okay, this fits my needs, and then they're gonna purchase from them. Yeah, and that's such good advice because uh, I do optimization as well. And just because a keyword has a lot of volume does not mean that you have to mention it everywhere. 
So right. I've noticed a lot of uh, new sellers get really exciting, to, excited to um, brand their products out there, especially if you're uh, selling in an unsaturated category. You have spent so much money on advertising and you've spent so, much, spent so much money on branding. They were like, oh no, we have to make sure that our product is visible everywhere. Use all the keywords that, that they are. But it, as a consumer, it does get really uh, complicated to see all those words that don't really make sense. So yes. um, thanks Emma for clarifying that and let's dive back to your PPT. Awesome. And one last point on that, your listing itself, the title and the bullets and the description aren't the only place to use keywords. So you do have back end uh, fields that you can fill with some of those words that either don't make sense or you didn't have space for. So don't feel like you need to shove it all into the front end. And now yeah. back to Branding. So I love this quote so much. Almost all the growth that's available to you exists when you aren't like most people and when you work hard to appeal to folks who aren't most people. And that quote is something really worth considering. And it's something that can be a little bit scary, especially when you're a new brand and you don't yet have that traction to think about being different. The, the desire and kind of natural instinct that most people have is the top competitors are doing something that works, so let's compete and do exactly what they're doing. But all you're doing is diluting yourself and it's going to make it much harder for you to be competitive with them because they already have that traction, they already have all of those reviews. And so by figuring out where you can actually differentiate yourself, then you allow yourself to compete in a way that is uh, much more effective. So the first thing you have to do is you have to figure out who you are. Uh, I know that this picture is a little bit silly, but I think that it helps to communicate a really important point, which is a lot of times companies will come and they'll take all of these different marketing tactics and they'll put them on and they're not at all truly related or relevant to who they are as a business or what types of products they're selling. And so it creates this very strong disconnect that customers can feel and it may come across as inauthentic or awkward or any number of different things. So you need to be clear about what you are at your core so you can make sure that there's an alignment and have a really compelling message through and through. So it doesn't look like you're trying to be manipulative and it's not as if you're just, you know, trying to push a sale at any expense, it's having that very cohesive uh, strategy that makes sense for your business. So if you're a sausage, then your marketing should be sausage related marketing, not trying to be a banana. That was so well and <laughs> So we have two examples here of uh, high caffeine coffees. So at their core, these coffees are more or less the same. Melita is a very well-known and long, long established brand. They've been in business for over a hundred years. And Black Rifle Coffee Company is a much newer player and they are an e-commerce coffee company. So I think that this is going to really demonstrate to you exactly what we were talking about. On the left with Melita, the first thing that I notice is their price is less than half of what Black Rifle Coffee Company is charging. And I would argue that one of the reasons that Black Rifle Coffee Company is able to charge more than double is because they figured out this branding piece. So that's one of the really cool things that can happen when you invest the time and effort into branding is that you're not solely having to compete on price or on reviews. You start to make the conversation about something else that is that the other that your competitors don't even speak to. So in this case, Melita's listing, it look or the bullets specifically, they look nice. They're using all caps headers, which can be really helpful in in telling customers what each bullet is about but it's very corporate, it's very bland, and it's not really doing anything to engage me. But also, this is a high caffeine coffee. So I would expect that a high caffeine coffee product page is going to be high energy. And this is not high energy. This is 
very much focused on them. You'll see that every single bullet is we, our, we, we're, and people don't care about you. They care about themselves. So putting people at the center is so important. And by doing that and by really matching their language to the product that they're selling or to figuring out what makes them truly different and special, like, in which bullet is it in the fourth bullet we invented coffee filters in 1908 i think that is so cool that's showing that they've really been innovators in the coffee space from the very beginning of probably when coffee started to be a more widely distributed product and so really honing in on that and their expertise in the coffee field would be something that could really start to differentiate them and instead it's just buried away and it's not really uh utilized to the full capacity. Now on the right hand side, we have Black Rifle Coffee Company. And interestingly enough, they're doing some things that I would suggest not doing. Like their bullets are longer than they should be. They're using emojis, which most of the time I would suggest not to use. But because they've done such a fantastic job on the branding piece and being clear about who they are, they can get away with that. So that really differentiates Black Rifle Coffee Company is that they're a veteran owned company. And they make that very clear from the very beginning of their marketing. And what is important to understand is embracing that is going to make a lot of people really excited. And it may also turn other people away because not everybody is very proudly pro-military and law enforcement. That's a pretty divisive topic right now. However, by having a very clear sense of who they are, the people that are interested in that are going to be extra excited by that and are going to want to spend that extra money to buy this coffee and are going to want to continue to buy from this company and are probably going to also be excited to tell other people about it or maybe even purchase merchandise and really become strong fans of the brand itself, not just buying the coffee because it's the cheapest or the first one that they came across. And if we go into the a plus content, we'll see a lot of the same thing with Melita. So it looks fine. It's just very generic. What if they had some pictures of the first coffee filter and really honed in on their story and established their credibility and their their sense of authority in this space? Instead, you could use Photoshop and replace everywhere that it says Melita with any other big coffee brand and it would work. There's nothing here that's differentiating them. And so they just kind of blend in. Black Rifle Coffee Company's A plus is a totally different strategy. They only have one module that is even speaking about their coffee specifically. Everything else is all about their brand. So they have pictures of their team, a letter from their founder talking about their mission statement, their brand and their culture. And so they're really using this space to invest in building a relationship with their customers. And if you notice and look a little bit carefully, you'll also see that there's little uh, merch promo pictures in here in a very natural way. So they're creating this whole identity that expands far beyond just coffee and really giving people an opportunity to be excited by what this company is doing. So it's, it's something that while this works really well, this strategy isn't going to work for everybody. And I don't want you to see this and think, okay, my A plus content needs to be exclusively focused on my brand. Some types of products are going to require clearer descriptions of what their product is or what's contained, or you may not have this really gripping story that requires so much focus. But even if you don't go to this extreme example, you can still find ways to weave in your story and what you're committed to and communicate those things in even a less obvious way. So you wanna be thoughtful about this and make sure that if you're taking a strategy like this, that you have a truly authentic story and something worth sharing and not just going and making something up because people will see right through that and it won't serve you in the long run. 
and that's such a good example especially black rifle uh they are connecting their message to human emotions so if your brand message connects to human emotions you know that your brand is going to stand out because uh one thing that i've learned is everywhere in the world each human feels the same emotion so emotions cannot differ in each country so if you're a seller and you have to make a brand make sure that you target human emotions that way people are going to relate to your product more and emma i have a question for you so we saw a plus content right now and there were two examples that you gave us so what do you think can be a perfect balance between images using images in your a plus content and using text in your uh A plus content. So some of that again, it goes back to so it. There are a few things that you want to be considering. You always want to take a step back first and think about your product and your brand and how this space can really serve as a good sales page for both of those things. So your A plus content is almost like a mini website for you to use as you see fit. And so sometimes like let's say that you're selling a very technical product or some piece of electronics. So it's very likely that that has a lot of things that you'll want to a lot of specific either functions or details that you'll want to show off in the A+ content and you can do that in a much more convincing way than just writing about it in your bullets. And so utilizing that some of those modules to do things like that can be really valuable. It's not storytelling based, but it is helping people understand your product and why it's better. I think that some people will go to the extreme of using almost no text and just making it one big infographic. I would argue that that's not the best direction to take. I think that that was a strategy when the when the the modules available were very clunky that some people took but now that Amazon has really stepped up their game with the types of modules that you have you know some of them are even interactive you have a lot of great things that you can work with and not using any text is is not really optimizing that space because this is a great place to explain your product to make sure that people understand it and that's not to say that you should go overboard and have these really big blocky chunks of things but thinking about how you can use images to present a, a certain concept and maybe even at times using infographics within the A+ content and then use some text underneath to help support or reinforce whatever it is that you're trying to demonstrate with your imagery. So it's just a balance. If you have a photo and then a big chunk of text that's so large that even on a desktop you need to scroll down to get to the next photo, that's <laughs> that's too much text. But it's not you know, I think people always want these set rules of okay, How many characters should I use in each module? And and there is a lot of nuance there. So it will depend on the product you're selling. Some products are much simpler and so they don't require a lot of text. And so if you're just putting it there just to put it there, it's probably not serving your overall uh goals. Yeah. All right, back to your PPT. Awesome. So building your brand identity this is something that whether you are just trying to figure out what product to sell or you've been in business for a long time it's a really valuable exercise to do and i would also say something that you should continue to do with time it's not an exercise that you do you check it off your list and you're and you're done with it forever it's worth revisiting because having a really clear brand identity and even having that some of those these things written down makes it much easier to get uh contractors on the same page with you so if you're hiring a designer or a videographer or writer or whatever that may be you can have this document to give them and they can instantly understand exactly what it is that you are trying to do and how you want to represent yourself it can also be very helpful for making decisions for training employees and making sure that you have co cohesion throughout your business it just is something that that serves many different uh purposes 
So one of the exercises that you can do to really hone in on this is creating a brand persona. And this is a really fun exercise where it's imagining your brand as a person. So thinking about what kind of clothing would they wear? What, uh, what types of language would they use? Do they have a sense of humor? If so, what kinds of jokes do they make? Uh, what's their favorite dish to eat when they go out to eat? You know, just be as fun and loose and ask as many questions as possible. And what that does is it helps take this kind of fuzzy idea and gives you a concrete sense of something that anybody can understand when they hear it. Because if you say, oh, my brand is a, a skate laid back skateboarder that you know, his favorite meal is a hamburger and he has a really dry, witty sense of humor, we're all on the same page almost instantly with what the imagery should look like when creating advertisements and what the text should be. And so that can be a really valuable tool. Honing in on your mission is very important. So thinking about what kind of world you are trying to create with this business. And that doesn't have to be something that you speak about outwardly, but having that very strong and clear in your mind is important uh, to have when you're in business. Clarifying your story is also really important. And like, we, like I was mentioning a little bit earlier, this doesn't mean make up a story. If you don't have that incredible origin story or that really exciting platform that you're on, that's okay. You can also think about what it is that you're trying to do with your business or the type of future that you're trying to create. And you can use that as your story as well. It doesn't just have to be about what's already happened. Thinking about what you stand for and what are those things that you're unwilling to compromise on very, very important. What makes you special? And thinking about how can you how you can differentiate yourself. So you're looking at your top competitors and not thinking about, okay, how can I compete head to head with them? But how can I actually make myself stand out in a way that they're not even thinking about right now? So we talked about your branding. That's ideally step one. If it's not, that's okay. Now we need to think about something that is another very important piece of the branding element, uh, which is ultimately who matters most? Your customers. You're not gonna have a business for very long if you don't have customers. And you wanna make sure that you are really putting them at the center of everything that you do. And you're not just solely creating things because you love them, but with an understanding that this is also something that your customers will love as well. So like with Black Rifle Coffee Company, it may seem like they're just talking about themselves, but even though they are talking about what they're themselves on the surface, they're really engaging their customers in something that they can be excited about. And it's just as much about the customers as it is about the brand. So we have an example here. Uh, I took this screenshot, I don't know if it's still the case, but at the time I took this screenshot, we have the number one pet supply in all of Amazon and the closest big brand competitor is number 3,098. So when we're talking earlier about this ability to compete head to head with big brands, this is another great example of a company that is doing a fantastic job and what is the product that was the number one best seller at the time of the screenshot? It was poop bags. Of all of Amazon, poop bags for, for dogs. Uh, not dog treats, not kitty litter. And I would never have thought of that. I don't know if you notice here, but there are over 27,000 reviews, which is just crazy to me that people would love a product like this so much that over 27,000 of them would get online to write a positive review. And so we have them head to head with Glad. Glad is a very recognizable brand, but they are not at all uh, competing at the same level as this earth rated uh, company. And there are a few things that are going on here that we can get into. So 
I have this side by side here, both with the imagery from Glad as well as the imagery from Earthrated. And I want to look at those first because when I'm talking about elevating with imagery and utilizing imagery and text together, Earthrated is doing a fantastic job of that. They are pointing out different design features that really speak to some of the common frustrations that pet owners have when using a product like this. I have a dog, every single one of these things, I'm like, yes, that's awesome. I love that they did that. That's a problem for me. Whereas on the right hand side with Glad, their only infographic is waste management products built with Glad level strength and innovation. Is that not the most jargony internal marketing language? Like there is nothing there that is speaking to the customer. It's really just kind of making Glad sound ordinary i don't know right? what any other yeah it just it's, it's not it's not it's not communicating anything it's almost that the picture would be more compelling if it didn't have that text there and then all we're looking at is the cute dog with the leash in its mouth um so glad only has one bullet on the left with earth rated they have very short and sweet bullets and they're just talking directly to the point they're not trying to pretend like they're a different product they are embracing the fact that this is a product meant for one of the less than favorite responsibilities that come along with having a dog and so they have a sense of humor about it they understand their customers they're connecting with them they're connecting with the concerns that they have and they're saying hey we hear you this isn't fun but we've tried to make this as painless as possible and we've made these really awesome uh, design feature upgrades so that you don't have to have the frustrations that you've had with with every other company. They're also a biodegradable product and they're even the the core of their roles is made of recycled paper that is also recyclable. So it's not just that they're trying to make the best poop bag. They are also speaking to people that are mindful of sustainability. And so they have another, another element in play, similar to Black Rifle Coffee Company, where their, their conversation is about more than just the basic function of this product. Here's GLAD's uh, A plus content. So again, <laughs> almost identical to, to Melita, just very, generic, very corporate looking. I don't think anybody needs an infographic about how to use a product like this. They're very self-explanatory. So that's just a waste of space. And then they're using the standard comparison chart, which is one of my favorite A plus content modules. However, they're not utilizing it in a very effective way. I don't look at this and immediately understand what the differences between these products are. And I don't even think that they've chosen the best products to use in this chart. Uh, I would say that your the comparison chart is best for two reasons. One is if you have a bunch of products that are very similar, it can make it really easy for customers to figure out what product is the right one for them without having to flip back and forth between a lot of different listings. The other way that this can be really effective is if you have some awesome complimentary yep. products. And I, so uh, for those of you are watching today and are watching this live, we discussed in last session that you need to understand what's trending and what's hot. So as you can see in the other the other poop bag, they were talking about how it's biodegradable. So uh, we had Aiden yesterday who told us that if you see a product that you want to sell, you see a product. So I think they saw a product, they saw a category and then you make it better. See what's hot, see what's trending and make it better. So what's hot right now? Biodegradable bags, care for the environment. And that's why green bags, eco-friendly bags are selling more than our glad bags. So back to you, Emma. Thank you. Yeah, no, that's so true. Uh, thinking about how you can actually differentiate your product is going to make all of these things that we speak about easier. You can still use these concepts to differentiate your product if it's the, you know, if it's identical to your competitors, but you have more to work with and more space to play with if you are actually innovating in some way the product itself.
So here's, not only do they have one uh, standard comparison chart, but they're, I didn't have space for it, but their A plus content has another standard comparison chart. So I think they could have done a much better job if I were them, what I would do. They have this, this uh, all of these refill bags, which are very unnecessary to have all of those there. Uh, so I would have consolidated it and had one with a dispenser, one with another scent, one with this other type of dispenser and then the sanitizing spray. Perhaps that would be a better use of the standard comparison chart and would make it more helpful in engaging the customers. But then I would also actually change the content itself so that it was very clear and easy to understand exactly what each of these products are and how to select the products that are best for my needs. Interestingly, Earth Rated is they don't have a plus content on this listing. So it's just a it's just a description. I think that they could probably do even better if they had a plus content, but they're able to perform at a very high level without even using that a plus content. So I think that this is just showing how successful they've been at understanding their customers at creating a product that their customers are going to be excited about and then communicating that in a way and marketing that in a way that that gives customers an opportunity to learn about these things because if they just had these features but weren't speaking about it and really uh, speaking about it in a way that was engaging and relatable to customers then it wouldn't matter because nobody would know about it and they would just get lost in a back page of Amazon. But instead, they've done a fantastic job at communicating these things and having a sense of humor about what they're selling and relating to their customers. Like you feel when looking at their listing that they have their own pets. We're glad it feels like they saw an opportunity because they're already in, you know, creating different types of plastic bags. Oh yeah, we can just make smaller plastic bags for this particular usage. And they've done nothing to relate to the customers and understand the situation that they're experiencing and what they would really be wanting in a, in a product like this. So put your customers first. Some things that you want to be considering when you are creating a listing or developing a product are identifying what your customer's interests are. So if they are very environmentally minded, how can you incorporate that into your marketing and into your product design? You don't have to think just about the main product itself, but think about what their other interests are as well. What types of social media influencers do they follow? What uh, what types of things are they consuming and other products that they're using in their lives? So get a very clear sense of where their interests lie and how you can connect with, to and relate with them around those things. Understanding their fears and worries is also really important. Like that sustainability piece that connects very deeply to fears and worries that customers have. So it's not just this positive idea of caring for the planet, but it's also coming from a concern about the fact that there are certain environmental issues happening in the world and that they're wanting to help prevent or mitigate what those negative repercussions are going to be through the choices of the products they're using. Similarly, with your brand persona, Creating a customer avatar or customer avatars can be a really helpful exercise. And what this is, is it's it's saying, it's, it's developing out some full profiles of specific customers. So giving them a name, saying what age they are, talking about what their lives look like, and having a really clear sense of these customers, who they are as people. Because so often when you're, when you're, creating a product or, or a marketing campaign, you're sitting by yourself or with a few people on your team in a room at a computer, and it can be very difficult to think about and, and understand who the ultimate end target of all of this is. And having a very clear picture of them will make it much easier to create things that are going to engage and excite them rather than just 
staring at a screen and, and forgetting about what happens once you put it out into the world. So thinking about what's important to them, what gets them excited. Using social media as inspiration can be really helpful, particularly if you are not, uh, if you don't relate directly to your customers and your target market. Going to popular influencers in the space that you're selling in can give you a strong sense of what people are talking about, how they're talking about them, how they're engaging around products similar to yours so that you can make sure to address all of those different things within within your your the different choices that you'll be making. Read reviews of competitors is a great way to get additional insight about what how your customers are thinking and feeling. And then even going into forums like Quora or Reddit, or if there are Facebook groups specifically targeted towards um, the, the niche that you're selling in or a certain type of people that would be within your customer demographic, then going there can also be not only a space to observe and get information, but even to ask questions and engage directly with people that you'll be selling to so that you don't just have to be making assumptions, but you can actually get their direct feedback. So those are all things that you can and should be thinking about as you start to put things out into the world to make sure that, that you're not just creating something that looks good, but it is going to be exciting to the people that you're wanting to sell to. Many questions that we get are related to when is the correct time for a seller to start branding. And if you're a new seller, you need to understand that growth and branding or, or promotion go hand in hand. Because if you're producing too much and if you're not promoting, there's no one to buy your product. And if you're promoting too much, you won't you won't have enough money to produce anymore. So they go in hand in hand. Make sure that you have um, money divided accordingly. And if you are a power seller, branding would do so much, like so much good to you. So start branding your products. Back to you, Emma. Yes, definitely. Branding is something that it's never too late to do, but the sooner you can do it with your business, the better. Because what I have seen a lot, it, particularly when people are starting Amazon businesses, just going after uh, trendy items, is that at some point they realize, hey, I'd like to start selling on my own website, or I really do want to invest in this branding piece, but I have this product catalog that is so random that I can't even create a brand around it. And so the thinking about branding from an earlier stage can actually really help you First of all, avoid those trendy products that everybody is going to be selling and that it's going to quickly become too crowded and, and hard to uh, be competitive in. But also it helps you figure out the types of products that you should be launching because you're getting that feedback from customers and you have a clear sense of where you're going. And so then when you get to the point where you do want to be expanding into other channels, you've set yourself up to make that much more seamless. But your branding is also about your packaging and your the language that you're using in your advertisements. It's about how you engage with your customers when there are problems, because there are always going to be problems that pop up, even, you even if you have the, the very best product. Sometimes things go wrong. And so really thinking about how you can create a cohesive experience for customers so that whether they're seeing you on social media or engaging with your product page on Amazon or interacting with a customer service representative, that they're getting the same uh, experience and those same inputs so that it's not feeling like, uh, you know, multiple separate companies that they're interacting with. Because if you say, you know, the customer comes first and then your customer service representatives don't act that way, then suddenly everything that you're saying it comes into question. So you really wanna make sure that you're very thoughtful about how all of those pieces are working together. Uh, and branding is such a big part of all of that. So we have one last example today. On the left, we have Intex. They're a very big brand. Uh, they're sold in Walmart and a bunch of other big retailers. And they are also doing quite well on Amazon. You know, at the time of these screenshots, they were number 35 in Toys and Games. But on the right, we have a unknown brand 
who is in the number four spot in Toys and Games. They're Splashy Z, and this is actually a listing that we helped launch last year. So they did amazingly all last year, and then when the weather got warm again, they just jumped right back up to a very tall, very high ranking. And on the surface, these products are very, very similar. On the left, it's a inflatable pool, and on the right, it's an inflatable pool type thing. It has some sort of sprinklers there, but on the surface, they're serving they're serving the same basic function to create. A, a safe and easy way for people to help their children be outside and cool off uh, during the summer months. In Texas, bullets are very basic. Not only are they exclusively feature focused, but they're very vague and they leave a lot of information uh, lacking. Like I, there are a lot of details here that I would want to know. They're not even saying what this product, what material this product is made out of, let alone helping me to understand, um, you know, what ages this is for. It says smaller children. That's, what does smaller children mean? Are we talking age? Are we talking size? I don't know. With Splashy Z, what's really interesting here is they're, while the same function is the same, they have created, once again, similar to Black Rifle Coffee uh, and earth rated, they've made the conversation about something more than just a pool. So they have integrated some design that makes this also a developmental toy that's going to help children uh, foster their physical and mental development. And first, I think that's important for all parents, but that's going to be particularly important for certain parents. And so they really make this a whole new product, essentially, by incorporating this other element that no other company is utilizing. Here is uh, the Intex A plus content. So I think it's the same photo. Yep. Yeah, same, same image from their main image. Uh, again, very lacking in much information at all. They're probably going to sell decently because there aren't that many small inflatable pools, but there's definitely a lot to be desired here and some things that they could do to make this A plus content a lot more compelling. Here is Splashy Z's A plus content. So you see they're using a lot of lifestyle imagery of people engaging directly with this product and really, again, talking about some of these other benefits. So while it's talking about playing in water and having fun, there's also a lot here that's talking about the development and, and this infographic on the right under empower your little ones early learning is particularly valuable and helping to communicate some of those other benefits that you're getting from a relatively simple product. And so through doing this, they've able they've been able to create an entirely new product category and achieve incredible success as a result. So you want to be really thoughtful about who you are as a brand, how you can differentiate your products, and then who you're selling to and what your customers are caring about. And then once you have all of those things in play and as you continue to dive in and, and get curious about all of these different things, you can really set yourself apart and create much more opportunity to, um, to obviously make sales, but really establish something that's going to last. That's not just going to be that trendy product from 2020, but a product that people are going to buy year in and year out for, for many years to come. Uh, so we actually have a free worksheet. If you want to go to marketingbyemma.com slash seller app, I think there should also be a link uh, with this presentation if you want to grab that. And that worksheet has a lot of different questions that you need to be considering both from the branding piece as well as about your customers and your competitors and use that worksheet as a jumping off point to really start to dig a little deeper and get curious and figure out where you can establish your competitive edge. Yep, I will link that uh, worksheet down below so uh, people who are watching can go see it and get their worksheet right away. Uh, thank you so much, Emma, for such insightful session. And before we end, I have two quick questions for you. So what are the top three mistakes that you see sellers make when it comes to branding their product or when it comes to A-plus content? 
I would say the top three mistakes. One is trying to look exactly like your competitors. So often people will see what's working for their competitors and they'll even want to name their their brand very similar to their competitors and they'll want to use the same colors. And it's almost as if they're hoping that customers will not notice that it's actually a different brand and, and kind of piggyback off of that brand's success. And that's, first of all, a dangerous game to be playing. But second of all, as we've seen, it's through the differentiation that you really have so much more opportunity. Trying to compete directly with a very big brand, it's going to really limit how you can differentiate yourself and how you can sell. So that I would say that's number one. Number two is not being thoughtful about how, what will really appeal to your customers. Everything from choosing your brand name, like I've seen so many really awful brand names for it, like that Amazon sellers choose. And I think they're not understanding that ideally with branding, you want to create something that when people hear your name, they associate it with your products. And so it's not something that you just wanna hide away. It's something that you want people to start searching out directly. And so if it's some you know, really technical sounding name or um, you know, your last name and three other last names holding company, that's not a very engaging brand name. So being thoughtful about the name is so important. That wasn't even the mistake I was going to talk about, but I think that in and of itself is one worth mentioning. And then I would say that the third mistake is starting to get into a little bit more of the design and everything like that. And un and being very thoughtful about how everything from the colors that you use to the language that you use makes sense with the product that you're selling and the customers that you're selling to. So that if you're selling um, a baby product that's meant for millennials who are very aware of, you know, the different, the, the greater nuances of gender and are not wanting to say pink is for girls and blue is for boys, but that any color can be for any child. If all of your branding is using pastel blues and pinks and you and saying, you know, baby boy with the blue and baby girl with the pink, you're going to totally alienate yourself from your target customers. So you want to be very aware of how all of those things, how they think about them and making sure that you're making choices that they're going to truly connect with rather than maybe even use as reason to go elsewhere. Yep, and that's such good advice. So when it comes to color specifically, I would suggest people to understand what color psychology is because branding is so important and color psychology fits perfectly there. So a McDonald's uses red and yellow for a specific reason, not because they look good together, but because uh, red and yellow grab your attention. They're bright. So make sure that you understand what color psychology is and how you can fit it in your brand. And be aware of social um, settings. So like, you need to understand that millennials are the ones who are earning right now and maybe they're the ones who are earning and buying your product more. So understanding your audience who's buying your product can help you understand brand your product better. So Emma, next to a uh, quick question number two, what is unethical branding on Amazon and what is uh, and how can sellers avoid unethical branding on Amazon? Because sometimes I realize the sellers don't even know something is unethical. So can you just brief us about that? Yeah, so, you know, ethics, I think, comes into a few different levels. So first of all, there are some things that Amazon just won't even allow you to do. And th that is, I would say, a good thing. But you want to be very aware of because if you do it, your account will be or your listing will be suspended very quickly. So, for example, using your competitors brand names in your listings, you can't do that. Uh, it sometimes I've seen people find ways of very subtly doing that, like maybe utilizing the word in a different way. But if you want to say your product is better than this or compared to this, you can't do that. An exception would be uh, is if your if your product is compatible with another product, you can say that. So let's say you sell a charger that can be used with Apple products. You can say compatible with Apple products, but you cannot say 
better than Apple products or make it sound like your charger is an Apple product. So that's so understanding how to use your competitors brand names and when it's acceptable and when it's not is really important. Some other things to be aware of are environmental claims, you know, the sustainable sustainable products are very popular right now and it's something that a lot of people are willing to even pay more money to buy products that have a less impact on the environment. But you need to make sure that you if you're saying something that you have the paper to back it up. So you have to be able to demonstrate that if your product is biodegradable that it is in fact biodegradable. Um but you also need to be aware of some of those words that are very trendy and you may even see people using. Technically Amazon saying you shouldn't use them. So something like eco-friendly that doesn't actually mean anything and it falls into that greenwashing category of using those um attractive catchy words that don't truly mean anything and you can get away with them sometimes in like your bullets and whatnot but the algorithm is much and i think not just the algorithm the their whole system is much stricter when it comes to a plus content and so words like that will get flagged even if you're using them in your images so you want to be very thoughtful about that and then the last piece is understanding where your product is really great but also understanding where your product isn't great and not trying to make a sale at any costs so a sale is only a worthwhile sale to make if somebody is going to want to keep the product and is going to be happy with it if you make a sale to the wrong person and then they're returning it not only is that creating a negative customer experience but it's negatively impacting your the health of your account and so you you don't want to just make your product sound amazing on all fronts if it can't truly stand up to those claims um So if your product isn't the best for a certain group of people, saying that will actually go a long way in making sure that the right kind of people are buying your product and you're building a lot of credibility with those customers. Oh, thank you so much for telling me that this one isn't for me. Do you have the one that is for me? Or at the very least they'll have a a positive experience of your brand and they're not buying it. figuring out it's not for them and writing a really angry negative review. Yeah, that was so well put. Thank you so much Emma. I'm sure that our viewers right now are so happy with the information that you've given them and if you're not already on your feet and like changing your branding or making some tweaks in it, what is wrong with you? Well, thank you so much. <laughs> Uh, for such a good session and um for those of you who are wondering if you how you can register your trademark and how you can protect your logo we have a video on that and i will link them that in the description or it will be as a card somewhere on the screen and um turn that like button blue and turn that subscribe button gray and join our family to talk and interact to more sellers and we answer all seller queries so if you have any put them in the comment down below and we will get back to you right away thank you so much emma and um Stay tuned for our next session that comes next that comes tomorrow and we will you will learn more in your Amazon journey. A seller app also has some tools that you can check out. I will link them down below again and start your Amazon journey with seller app and sign up for a free trial with us and we will make sure that your sales are skyrocketing. So this is it for today's session and thank you so much for joining us in Amazon Q4 Mastery and we will see you tomorrow.